Hi everybody, welcome back to another video. I'm Mark, a diabetes specialist dietitian, and today we're talking about everything you need to know about long-acting insulin. But before we get into it, make sure you check out the website, which is www.diabetesdietguide.com, where we bring you free information about optimizing your glucose control. Or if you don't even have diabetes, we have a bunch of information about living healthy lives, lots of information about different diets. So go make sure you go check it out. Returning to long acting insulins then. So this is another video in our medication series. And like all our videos in the medication series, this is not advice about whether or not you should take these medications. It's purely to give you information so you understand a bit better how they work. So let's stop dilly-dallying and get right into it. What are long-acting insulins? Long-acting insulins are just one of many different types of insulins used in the treatment of diabetes. They are quite a robust class of medication and can be used in type 1, type 2, type 3, and many different types of diabetes management. Typically, they're injected once or twice a day, depending on the individual circumstances and that patient's needs. There are many different brands, but the most common types include Lantus, Levomir, Abazagla, Traceba, and Tegeo, although there will be other options available depending on where you live and your general locality. These insulins can be grouped into different individual categories though, depending on how they work. So we have the Glar genes, which include Lantus and Abazagla. We have Detamir, which is your Levomir insulin. However, as with anything, technology is advancing and we've seen newer insulins come to market, including Traceba, which has created a new category of insulins called Declodec. Long-acting insulins are also called background or basal insulins, and often these words are used interchangeably in diabetes care. So if you hear people referring to background, basal, or long-acting insulins, we're referring to the same thing. How do long-acting insulins work? The simplest way to think about long-acting insulins is that they work on the liver, so they prevent it from releasing too much glucose. Therefore, long-acting insulins aren't really much to do with food and the carbohydrate and therefore glucose that enters your system after eating. Without diabetes, your liver releases just the right amount of glucose because it has the right amount of insulin being circulated in the system. With diabetes, however, there's either a lack of insulin or the insulin that is being released isn't working as well. So usually the liver starts to release too much glucose, which can lead to hyperglycemia or high blood glucose levels. There are oral medications that can help prevent this from happening, but after these are no longer effective, that's when we might be looking at using a long-acting insulin. Long-acting insulins are called long-acting because they are pretty long-acting. So they vary anywhere between 18 hours to 36 hours in duration. So once you inject them, you get good coverage from your insulin release. The duration depends on when the insulins were produced. So the older insulins like Levomir tend to last a little bit shorter, whereas the newer insulins like Traceba have a much longer duration. However, regardless of the brand, you still need to take these every day and usually they can be taken once or twice a day depending on the brand and as I said earlier, your individual circumstances. Sometimes a long-acting insulin will not be enough on its own and you will also need to take a rapid-acting insulin alongside your background insulin or your long-acting insulin. Together, a long-acting insulin and a rapid-acting insulin is called a basal bolus regimen. Now we'll talk more about that in our rapid insulin video, which if it's not uploaded at the time of filming, is coming soon. If it is uploaded, then make sure that you go check that out if you are taking those types of insulin. Whenever talking about insulin, we need to understand a concept called your insulin peak. And this basically describes how much insulin is released at any one time into your body. Now the older insulins tend to have a larger peak. So when you inject them, you get more insulin at the beginning compared to, when you'd, uh, compared to later in the day. Whereas the newer insulins tend to be more of a flatter profile, so the release of insulin is pretty steady. So if I was to draw this out, it looks a little something like this. So if we just draw out a graph here, and down here is your time, and here is your insulin release, the older types of insulin we generally enter your system and have a bit more of a peak and then trail off. Whereas the newer types are much flatter in profile. So they tend to be a bit more like this. Now the reason this is relevant is because the flatter insulins 
tend to give you less risk of experiencing hypoglycemia or low blood glucose levels. As you can understand probably by looking at this, when you have more insulin in your system at any one time, it increases the risk of blood glucose levels actually dropping too low. So really, one of the name of the games of long-acting insulin is preventing hypo-low blood glucose levels. How long-acting insulin is administered? At the time of filming, all insulin can only be administered by an injection or via an insulin pump. With long-acting insulins like the aforementioned ones earlier, they have to be injected via a subcutaneous injection, which involves just injecting into various sites around the body, which might be the stomach, the back of the arms, the top of the thighs, or in the buttocks. Generally, fleshy areas. How many times a day do I take long-acting insulin? Long-acting insulins will generally need to be taken once or twice a day, depending on your individual requirements. The older insulins like Levomir, which lasts about 18 hours, sometimes might be taken twice a day, just to give you a full 24 hour coverage. The newer types of insulin, like Traceba, last 36 hours, although you still take them every day, but generally they only need to be taken once a day. People that have high insulin requirements might actually have two injections just to reduce the amount of insulin being injected at any one time, which can help reduce fatty lumps under the skin, which can affect how your insulin's absorbed. How much insulin do I need? This will depend on you. So every patient is different and essentially your insulin requirements are your insulin requirements. So some people will take much larger doses, whereas some people will take much smaller doses. So don't worry too much about this. There are no right and wrongs here. Although you do find that people that tend to be more inactive or overweight require more insulin compared to their fitter and slimmer counterparts. How often do I need to test my blood glucose levels? Whenever insulin is involved, it is always recommended and very much encouraged to test your blood glucose levels. Your medical team or your diabetes team will show you how to do this. With long-acting insulins, when they're initially commenced, you might find that you test a bit more frequently, but generally once you find that you've settled into your rhythm, you may only need to test once or twice a day maximum. This is just to help monitor how your blood glucose levels are reacting to the insulin and just to ensure that you're not having particularly high or low blood glucose levels. Of course, your GP will also be doing a HbA1c test, which is a three month snapshot of what your blood glucose levels have been doing for the previous three months. So if anything's particularly untoward, it's generally picked up on the HbA1c test. But remember, this is only an average, so it won't pick up particularly high or low glucose levels as one-off occurrences. How do I know if my dose is correct? There's a couple of methods to test whether or not your long-acting insulin is sufficient. One of the easiest tests is just to see what your glucose levels are doing first thing in the morning before you've eaten or done any exercise. If you're waking with a high or low blood glucose level, it shows that the insulin is likely not enough or too much. Therefore, alongside your diabetes team, you can start to adjust the insulin as needed. One thing I personally don't like to see though with long-acting insulins is big swings in your glucose levels overnight. So should you do a test and your glucose levels are particularly high, say 25, and you wake up with a glucose level of five, obviously that's a 20 millimole per liter swing. So had you gone to bed a bit um, lower on your glucose levels, you might have been at risk of having an episode of hypoglycemia or low blood sugars, which can be dangerous. On the flip side, we also don't want them to climb too much overnight either. So if you're going to bed with a reasonable blood sugar and waking up with a very high blood glucose level, it might be an indication that the insulin is not sufficient and therefore it's not enough to control your glucose levels and your liver is just kicking out too much glucose overnight. If you have doubts, always just tie in with your medical team and they can discuss what to do with you. One other thing you can do to test whether or not your long-acting insulin is sufficient is perform a basal test. Now remember, long-acting insulin is also called a basal insulin, so essentially we're just assessing whether your basal dose is correct. And the way we do this is remove all the variables that may affect your blood glucose levels. So that includes carbohydrates in the diet, and it also includes exercise. So pick a day when you know you're going to be idle and have some carbohydrate-free meals. So carbohydrate-free foods include any protein foods like meat, eggs, nuts, fish, Vegetables and salad are also very low carbohydrate. Cheese is no carbohydrate and fats like oils and spreads are also no carbohydrate. So have a meal based around these foods 
And you may want to repeat this at breakfast and lunch and then on the next day, maybe lunch and dinner and just see what the trend is over the next couple of days. But you will have to test your glucose levels before each meal to get an idea of what the glucose levels are doing. Once you've done this, you can start to see how the glucose levels are responding. If they start to rise, despite the fact you've not done anything to increase your glucose levels, it shows you that probably your long acting insulin isn't giving you sufficient coverage to stop that rise. On the flip side, if they start to drop, it shows you that actually your long acting insulin is pushing your glucose levels down despite the fact you're not doing anything else to make them drop like exercise. Some people prefer this test because they're in control, they're not asleep and they're able to see it in real time. Again though, if you have any concerns, just speak to your diabetes team or tie in with your GP or diabetes specialist nurse. How often should I adjust my dose? In healthcare, we really encourage patients to own their own management, and this is particularly true in diabetes. Many of our patients will adjust their insulin based on what their glucose levels are doing. Of course, because you're just watching this on YouTube or on the blog, make sure you're comfortable to do this and make sure you speak to your healthcare team before you start doing this. With regards to long-acting insulin, it really depends on the type of insulin that you're using. The older brands like Levomir and Lantus, and also one that only lasts 24 hours like a Basagla, in theory can be adjusted every couple of days, but we obviously don't want you to be adjusting it too frequently because you will not get any consistency with your glucose control. It's much best to pick a dose, stick with it for a few days, assess the trends, and then adjust accordingly. The newer insulins like Traceba and Tegeo actually have a 36 hour and perhaps even longer duration. Now these insulins actually take about three days to reach a steady state. So if you were to increase it on the Monday, you wouldn't really see the result until the Wednesday of that increase. Therefore, you need to be a bit more cautious with these insulins because what you don't want to do is keep adjusting them every day because the insulin might start to stack up and actually the dose that you thought wasn't sufficient actually kicks in a couple of days later, is sufficient, but by that point you've actually gone even further and you're setting yourself up for problems. So with these newer insulins, Traceba and Chiseo, it's really best to just wait three days before making any more adjustments. In terms of how much you should adjust by, we tend to go slow and steady, so just increasing by 10% increments tends to be pretty good practice. If you're experiencing low glucose levels, we'd rather take a bit more off, so we'd generally recommend reducing by 20%, and if you find that you've taken too much off, you can start to creep it back up. As I say, with diabetes, it's really about assessing the trends, so try not to be too cavalier when adjusting these insulins, and actually give them a little chance to see what the effect is after you've made the adjustment. So every two to three days, depending on the type of insulin you're using, tends to work quite well. Benefits of long-acting insulin. One of the key benefits is it gives you 24-hour insulin coverage, which is particularly important in type 1 diabetes. One of the key benefits with long-acting insulins is that they give you 24-hour insulin coverage. Before the invention of long-acting insulins, we had to rely on intermediate-acting insulins that only have a 12-hour lifespan. That meant you had to take two injections a day, and therefore were a lot more burdensome. In other words, it just meant more injections. Also, compared to the intermediate acting insulins, long acting insulins actually have a much lower peak, and even the newer insulins like Traceba and Tegeo have an even reduced peak from there. So if you remember my graph, this might be more like your intermediate acting insulin, and this is more like your Traceba, with the others somewhere in the middle. This reduces the incidence of hyperglycemia and just keeps patients a lot more safe and gives them steadier glucose levels, so there's a less variability. Negatives of long-acting insulin. Some of these aren't necessarily long-acting insulin specific, but of course with any insulin, they want to reduce your blood glucose levels and therefore they put you at risk of low blood glucose levels. So recognizing the symptoms of this is very important and your diabetes team should have talked to you about this. If you're not sure of them, check out the Hypo blog, which is also on the website, diabetesdietguide.com. Insulin is also what we call an anabolic hormone, which means a build-up hormone. So in other words, it encourages you to gain weight. The weight gain isn't tremendous, perhaps a couple of kilograms on average, but if you're already struggling to lose weight, then you can see how it just exacerbates the situation. As long-acting insulins work away in the background, primarily on the liver, they're not always sufficient to cover the glucose entering from the diet. If you're seeing your blood glucose levels rise throughout the day as a result of what you're eating or drinking, then it might be that the diabetes team needs to look at adding in additional medications or even additional insulins. Alternatively, you can always look at what you're eating and perhaps it might be that you need to follow more of a lower carbohydrate diet. And there you have it guys, everything you need to know about long-acting insulin. I hope you found it useful. 
If you need more help, check out the blog, diabetesdietguide.com, where we have loads of free information, as I keep saying. But also, if you need a further helping hand, we also offer consultancy services where we personalize our approach one-to-one -one and we work with you and coach you through the whole process about either glucose optimization, living healthy lives, or whatever your goals might be. If one-to-one -one consultancy isn't for you, you can always check out our programs and also our guides, which are also available on the website, which again give you step-by-step -step guides about how to manage your diabetes, but aren't as intensive or personalized as the one-to-one -one consultancy packages. So check it out. I hope you found this useful and we'll see you at the next video.